Yes, here we are. It's the Physics 105A video lecture. Physics 105A video lecture 16. This is our penultimate lecture and I'll just uh, pick up where I left off last time and then say a few words about what's to follow. The 17th lecture will be a review basically and a heads up on what to expect on the exam. But we're still doing some really interesting stuff here. So we started talking about point mechanics last time. So mechanics of a system of point particles. So we call this point mechanics. And the idea is that it's a system of point particles that interact via Newton's law, interact with each other. Um, Via whatever actually whatever interaction law they have. Yeah. So I'm going to re uh, review a few of the points I made. So here's particle one, m sub one, and here's particle two, m sub one and m sub two. But what I think I'll do here is say that this was particle i. This is particle j. We have m sub i, m sub j, r sub i, and r sub j. And if we're focusing on the ith particle, then we could have j extend through a whole cloud of them. So I'm just labeling these two, and there are many more. Okay, okay so in this circumstance, what we looked at was Newton's law. The force on the ith particle equal to, so mass times acceleration, he said there was possibly an external force on the ith particle. And the idea with the external force is it's not a, it doesn't arise from these other forces, from these other particles, but these other particles are also exerting a force, influence, and so those are the ones we sum up J equals one to n. F sub i j, j is a force the jth particle exerts on the ith particle. So j is not equal to i, but otherwise 1 through n. Yeah, we already did a, a bunch of work with this expression, but I'm just going to come back and uh, rebuild one of our examples. And that was using Newtonian gravity. Since we've studied two bodies and we're just generalizing here. So let's go ahead and build this up from scratch. Basically a review of some stuff I had on the board where the formulas get pretty complicated. Okay. So let's look at it in this way. So Newton, so Newton gravity And how did we learn it the first time? We had F equals F of R, R divided by R. Okay. Then we had a central force. What we then did was we said we had minus one over R squared times the unit vector. So the unit vector pointed from the origin to our particle, and then the minus sign points back. So it's a attractive force, minus 1 over r squared unit vector. Now what I did with the system of point masses, I had this f sub ij is equal to minus, oh, correct this. We were using an alpha there for everything, okay, minus alpha over r squared. So this time I'm going to write in place of alpha minus g m i m j. G m i m j over r i minus r j magnitude squared. Remember this vector r was actually the difference vector, so it was this vector here was this one, r i minus, that was r1 minus r2 the other time, squared. And now we have a unit vector, 
which is this r i minus r j, the vector, divided by its magnitude. So you can see this is exactly what I have underneath here is exactly what I had here before. For 1 and 2, this r1 minus r2, that's what these things were here. I put in Newton's law of gravity. So now if I want to do the summation, um, I should I rewrite that thing. Yeah, actually let's just discuss it for a moment. So these are our f of f i j, for example, that we we're talking about right here. Now I just have to do a sum of those. And yeah, we'll go ahead and erase. Let's go ahead and put the minus sign here. So now, since I constructed the thing, I have j equals 1 to n, and I have j not equal to i. Good. And then over here, I'm going to have m i r i. That's a derivative. Okay. So now instead of just one, it's all n of them, or n minus one of them. And yeah, so that makes the connection with what we had done here, which remember came from a two-body problem, reduced to one body. And this complicated expression. I know this thing looks pretty bad when you're seeing it for the first time, but now that we've built it, it makes some sense. I'm going to do the same thing for the potential energy that we had been using in the central force. Okay, so there's that expression for a system. There's no external force in here. Okay, this is just the mutual forces of all the particles. Okay, the next part of this discussion is the potential energy. So the potential energy function, we want its, the negative of its gradient to give us the force. Okay, and we just have an example of the force. So how do we construct that potential energy? Originally we had u of r was equal to minus alpha over r. But if this was a two-body problem that we had started with, then again, this was the magnitude of that difference. So now, and here I gather, this time I'm going to leave some room. So now I'm going to start with leaving myself some room there to the left to fill in. I'm going to start with my minus G M I M J. J. Okay. Magnitude. So that was for two particles. Exactly this. Filled in what that alpha means. Now the thing is, I have a whole cloud of these. I have n particles, and I want the potential energy. So what I'm going to do is sum over these. And I'm doing a double sum. J equals 1 to n. J is not equal to i. Because you can't have this vanishing. So that's a double sum. And what that does is it gives us all the pairwise potential energies. We're just adding them all up. But because of this form of the double sum, we're getting them twice. So when we have an i, j, we also have a j, i. So because of that, we put a one half in front. That gets rid of the, you know, that takes into account the double counting. And this is our u. And I'm going to go ahead and write r1 to rn. So it's this object whose gradient with respect to any individual particle here should give us that force uh, that I had just written down. 
and we'll do that next semester. It's a great, you know, you guys can do it in summer vacation. You can do it anytime you want. It's a bit of a tricky calculation. I don't want to get bogged down with it now. But uh, just by the construction of this, you can see, well, this makes sense. This is just all the pairwise potential energies that would be here in this uh, collection of particles interacting gravitationally. Okay, so that is just a, kind of a repeat, but leave yourself room and you can fill this in and play around with them, understand them. That's where they came from. So we then had conservation laws. I'm going to leave this expression up here and discuss the two conservation laws that we had, do one more, and that's pretty much all we'll do today. We're in no hurry, but this shouldn't take too much time. That's what I want to finish with. So now, conservation laws. And the first conservation law was energy. And what the way we showed it was we had to have a potential energy function so if you have a u of r, 1 to rn, such that f sub i equals minus gradient sub i of u. So if you can find one of those or put one of those together, then the energy is conserved and the energy is the sum of the individual kinetic energies plus that potential energy. Then that energy is conserved. Okay. It is conserved. So we had that, we showed it, and uh, Important, definitely important, energy conservation. The next conservation law, working again, we were working with this expression up here. Next one was linear momentum. So let's look at linear momentum once again. What we had found there was. that the internal forces all summed away to zero and we summed up this entire expression here. And we found that um, capital P equals sum of lowercase p sub i sum of m sub i r sub i dot. So the total linear momentum of the system is conserved if the net external force vanishes equals constant comma if sum of f external is equal to zero. So that's the conservation of linear momentum. When we go into collisions, we'll be talking about the conservation of linear momentum. Or we'll be using it. To uh, collisions next semester. Okay, so we have that again, referring back to this formalism here. And from linear momentum, we had an interesting uh, corollary of sorts. Namely, concerning the center of mass. center of mass. You know, I just introduced the center of mass as a definition that you, had, everyone's probably seen before. So for this cloud of particles or this collection of particles, it's the sum of these moments divided by the total sum. Okay. And that's the point in space 
that is the center of mass. And you know, for a point system, the center of mass, of course, doesn't have to lie on some point, it's just some location within that set of masses. So with the center of mass defined like this, we found that total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to the net external force. And the sum of those forces that I just erased. Okay. So, very interesting. If you throw some irregularly shaped object, say you just grab it and toss it, like a table or a bicycle or something, then the center of mass of that object will be uh, moving along the parabolic trajectory. The object itself can be tumbling and twisting and turning, its center of mass moves along that trajectory. So that we have here very formally, simply in this, in this expression right here. There's also an interesting point about what the center of mass is. There's another way to introduce it, actually. So I'm going to just put this as an important node. The center of mass is the origin of the coordinate system in which the total linear momentum vanishes. Okay, so let's put that in words and then we'll prove it. So the center of mass is the origin of, all right, of that coordinate system, of the coordinate system, that coordinate system in which Total momentum, total linear momentum vanishes. In fact, that's a way to, so to speak, derive what the center of mass really is. If you're progressing in the way we did right now, you could say, okay, now let's look for a coordinate system in which the total momentum vanishes, and then that would define the center of mass. So maybe I should put that on homework for next semester. Okay, I'm not assigning anything new anymore. Um, that would be a good one to get the ball rolling with next time. I'll leave it as a theorem. It's just a fact, but if I say theorem, you guys have to try to prove it. Okay, how about that? Good. So that's an interesting point as well. And you know what I'll do? I'll mention our two-body problem. Remember we did the center of the central force problem, the Kepler problem, originally was two bodies reduced to formally one body. So yeah, that's actually that's what I'm gonna do. Leaving these up because we can use them again. Okay, so example of what I just said. We had two bodies. I can draw this sufficiently large. So there's R1. Here's R2, right? M1 and M2. As you recall, and then we had defined this vector here as R1 minus R2, and we just named it R. Okay, that was our vector R that we had used for the center, uh, central force problem. Now, you may recall that I had actually used the definition of the center of mass. Namely, I had said, I had said R center of mass is equal to M1 R1 M2 R2 divided by M1 plus M2. Okay, I had used that, 
and then set the numerator equal to zero in order to get the definition of R1 and R2 in terms of this R. And we never looked at it again, and we're not going to either. Well, maybe we'll look at it next time, next semester. We didn't, we didn't refer back to it again. Maybe I should have done that after all. <clears throat> but I'm doing it now. So yeah, we had set the, that equal to zero in particular, you know, we used the numerator being equal to zero. And that allowed us to determine R1 and R2 in terms of the difference vector. And then we just went on our way, but that was an example of turning the center of mass or taking the center of mass as the origin. That's basically what we had done. And then it'll turn out that M1 R1 dot plus M2 R2 dot is equal to zero. Okay. That means the total linear momentum is equal to zero. That means this is the origin and if one's moving to the right, the other one's moving to the left and vice versa. So this was an example of that. Um, you know, I will, since we're on the subject, I will make a little reference to our Kepler problem here. So, yeah, let's go ahead and erase this. So here, let's just say, note, recall, Kepler problem. We solved for this R that we had the whole time was actually R1 minus R2. In other words, we solved for the motion of this, and it's really this R1 minus R2. And then we had, now do I know this off of my memory here? We had R1 was equal to I think this was M2 over M1 plus M2 R, R2 minus M1, M2 R. Okay, actually look those up in your notes. I'm pretty sure I got them right. Point is, is that the orbit here for our Kepler problem and its elliptical properties and stuff is actually transferred down to these individuals, R1 and R2. What that means is that a two-body system, say the Earth and the Moon, okay, so one of these is the Earth and one of them is the Moon, a two-body system of that type is actually executing um, elliptical orbits around their common center of mass. So the Moon has an elliptical orbit around the center of mass, which our homework told us was somewhere inside the Earth. And the Earth is also doing an elliptical orbit, so the Moon's elliptical orbit is, of course, pretty big. The Earth's elliptical orbit around the center of mass is just this small, you could say, wobble. Okay. okay, so that's a point I hadn't brought up before, and let it be said now. in the context of many body systems. We've lost sight of it completely. And you know, for very small um, satellites, it's as though the, the large body is just nailed down. But when there's some comparable mass involved, then, then the, they both have to be taken into account. Okay. I think that's how the astronomers discover planets out there in the cosmos, after all various techniques, including whether a star has a bit of a wobble there, um, which would indicate, you know, orbiting planets. Okay, so we still have one conservation law to do now. This third one is going to be about angular momentum. It's the most interesting of all those proofs. So let's have a look. how much time is going here. Okay, yeah. Okay, so next we're still doing conservation laws in the angular momentum. But I'm 
going to do is take the cross product from the left of this entire formula in the following manner. I'm going to look at R sub I cross M sub I R sub I second derivative. And I'm going to leave a lot of room here because then I'm going to sum them all. So then I'm going to have, yeah, I'll do the summation right now. So I'm cross product from the left and then sum from I equals one to N. I equals one to N. So then on the right side I have sum over R sub I cross F sub I external forces. And over on this last term, it's going to give me that double sum, I equals one to N J R sub I cross F sub I J. I not equal to J. Good. If that was a if this was an equation, then this is also an equation. So here we're going to look at this double sum first. And what we see is because of the symmetry in I and J for every R sub I cross F I J, there must also be an R sub J cross F J I. So we would have these two terms for any I J pair and then sum them all up. That's something interesting here. First of all, Fij and Fji are the same force. One of them has a minus sign because by Newton's third law. Okay, equal and opposite, same force. Force between the i's and the j particle. So we can write, we can, we'll pull a minus sign out of this one and we'll then have r sub i minus r sub j. That'll be the common factor that we're crossing into F I J. So F J I is minus F I J. And I took that into account by putting the minus sign. Common factor. Okay, and now this is really interesting because we have this cross product, and if the forces between those point particles are central forces, then by definition this vanishes. Okay. So we're going to make that a stipulation in our point mechanics formalism that the forces between two point particles in space are central forces. So let's put that there, equals zero if Fij central force, which is to say this double sum sums up to zero, and we're left with this left side. Okay. This is what we're left with. This has all summed up to zero. Now this left side here can be written as, I'm just going to write it down and then I'll argue it. It's the time derivative R I cross M I R I dot. The reason that's the case is that if I take this derivative, I'll get, if I differentiate the first vector here, I'll have R I dot and the cross product with another ri dot is zero, because they're parallel. Okay, cross product with parallel vectors is zero. And then when I'm doing the product rule, I'll keep this and take mi ri second derivative there, and that's of course what I have above. So this is identical, and the right side, I'm just going to leave what it is. Um, well, I'm just gonna write, that is my net torque 
for the system definition. Net, oh, external. So tau external net. A lot of labels, that's the net external torque on the system. And this here is the angular momentum. So I have a theorem. The time derivative of the total angular momentum is equal to the net external torque. Let's go ahead and write the words total angular momentum. That's this thing right here. So yeah, that's what I'm going to wrap this all up with. So let's uh, erase this. So this is what we had been left with. That turns out to be this, or D capital L BP is equal to tau net external. Derivative of the total angular momentum of the system is equal to net external torque. Now, if the net external torque is zero, then we get conservation of angular momentum. And that's our last conservation law here. So as a note, or just as a corp, or as a consequence, if the net external torque equals zero, then total angular momentum is conserved. How great is that? Okay. Now there's a little more to say about this. To go back to that uh, central force condition. So this theorem in a, in a system of point particles is only true if the forces are central. Okay, Because that's how we were able to erase the rest of this mess here. The whole internal forces business. So that is a, worthy of a note. The forces are assumed to be central forces in order to get this law of conservation of angular momentum. Now for the solar system, that's no problem. For a system of charged particles, in fact, this theorem would not be true. Because the forces between charged particles in motion are not just central forces. And uh, in fact, you don't even have a potential energy U of R1 to Rn for that. So energy, neither energy nor angular momentum um, are strictly conserved for a system of charged particles. In fact charged particles in motion radiate energy and angular momentum away. Um, you probably heard that's the reason the Bohr model was known to be impossible in a sense, or the Rutherford model. Let's say the Bohr model. The problem was with, with those ideas that made it necessary to invent quantum mechanics that the model of an electron orbiting a proton was a nice idea, but strictly by electromagnetism and mechanics, it should have just radiated its energy away and not given, uh, not given clean uh, energy levels. Good. So, but that's where the point is not to talk about that so much, but to show that the, here in point mechanics, um, that's where the conservation of angular momentum comes from. It requires true central forces. Good. And I think that's about what we're going to end with right here. Many other things we could talk about. So we have the point mechanics, we have the conservation laws. What we'll end up doing next semester is collisions. We'll start with collisions, uh, but we'll then try to get into continuous systems, systems as well so we can do the rocket equation. And uh, we also need the point mechanics in order to segue into extended systems, continuous extended systems, you kind of do point mechanics and take a limit. Uh, to an extended uh, continuous system. We have to prove that a spherically symmetric gravitating body is just like a point mass. 
and we'll do that. So yeah, we'll, we'll do a million things. Okay, good. Uh, keep taking good notes. See you next time.